Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's Craig Scott from Fight Talk here. I am joined, it's a privilege to be joined on the phone today by top 10 world ranked middleweight Jason Quigley. Donnie Gall's on. Jason, how you doing, mate? All good, Craig. All good. Pleasure to be chatting. How are things? Yeah, brilliant. Um, excellent to have you on. I'm glad I've got someone who can finally understand my accent. This is good for me. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Obviously, I know it's a busy time for you just now. You've got a fight coming up March 23rd against Glenn Tapia for the NABF middleweight title. How's, how's the camp going so far, mate? Everything's been going great, Craig, as always, you know what I mean? This is, uh, this is the stage of, the career, of my career that I'm at now where I'm really excited and where I've always wanted to get to, you know, start out in your professional career. You're fighting a lot of guys that, Going into going into the fight, you know that you can handle, and you, and if you perform well, that you know you can look good and come away with a victory. Whereas now, you know you're coming to the stage of the career where every fight is vital. Every fight is like a world title fight for you because it gets you that one step closer to fighting for that belt. And yeah. you know every fight now, I gotta be on my game and I gotta get in there and perform to the best I can to come out victorious. Definitely. I think obviously a lot of people who are maybe listening are maybe just kind of finding out a little bit about you. Now, I used to follow your uh, your diary entries on Sky Sports when you used to write your little fight diaries before your fights and stuff. How how has it changed for you, the magnitude of the events and obviously now you're headlining an event for Golden Boy? Does that add any pressure for you? Not really, Craig, you know, because this is what I've been preparing myself for since day one. You know, I'm very grateful and lucky to be signed with Golden Boy Promotions because, you know, they are the pinnacle of promotions and boxing. And to have the likes of them, they put me on the Canelo Lara on the card for my pro debut in the SGM in Vegas. You know, that was really to set me up, show me exactly what it's all about. It's okay, whenever I was fighting, there might have been 10 or 50 people in the, in the audience. <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, I was there for the build-up, I was there for the press conferences, media workouts, everything like that, the way and you know, and then obviously I was there there for the big fight later on that night, so, you know, I've been prepared for these days and been prepared for these moments in my career, and you know, I'm just really excited and really looking forward to it, because these are the stages that I've been wanting to get to all my career. And it's only started now. This is the start for me. And I'm really, really excited and really looking forward to it. It's my first headline main event show over here in LA. You know, I know where I come from. I come from a small area back at Open Donegal. And, you know, for the likes of me to be a headline to show out here in LA is a big privilege for me and my family. And, you know, I'm very proud for doing it. And that's all of them sitting and look at it that way, but I can't and I don't have time to sit back and look at it that way. I have to understand that this is where I am and this is where I'm meant to be right now and I'm ready to grab these opportunities in both hands. Obviously you you are from a, a small area in Donegal. I know I, I read a little bit where you were talking about it previously in a couple of interviews. Do you do you bring a lot of people over? Do people travel over for the fights or is it mainly family and stuff that would come over to LA for the fights? There actually is, like, I'm very lucky and blessed and grateful also, like, for the support that I have. And that has been going on since I was an amateur. You know, I've had people that travel to the Eastern European countries for my amateur tournaments with a national team and everything like that, and traveled all around Ireland as well to watch me fight. And since I've turned professional, you know, every fight is starting to get bigger and bigger. The support, the fan base, everything is getting bigger. There's more people starting to come out to my fights. And that's really a piece, you know, to be honest, it really, really is. And I'm very grateful and blessed to have this opportunity to help my friends and family and Irish people to come out and support me out here because, you know, it's not easy traveling from Ireland all the way across to the West Coast of America. And, you know, very near future, I plan on bringing big time boxing back to Ireland where my friends and family and everyone like that doesn't have to travel as far. 
Yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask you about that as well. Obviously, fighting back on, on these shows is, I'm sure, something you would be interested in. Um, Jason, I, I know that you had a, an extensive amateur career. You were a, a world silver medalist, European gold medalist. You were primed to go to 2016, or you were you were tipped to go to 2016. What changed your mind about that, and what, what made you say, right, this is the time to turn over and move into the professional ranks? The way, the way amateur boxing was going, you know, with decisions, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen in Rio, the decisions haven't been great, you know what I mean? It's, it's very political. Yeah. And also, to be honest, you know, you're fighting, for me in the world championship, I had five fights in seven days. You know, and to go through five hard fights at world class level to come out with no cuts or anything like that there. It's like it's like it's a mindset, you know what I mean? Because you know, you're engaging with opponents every day, five days and seven, five days and seven days, you know what I mean, fight. So for me, you know, I had the possibility of hanging around for another three, four years and going to qualifiers for Olympic Games battling with the political side of things and then also if you get caught in your first fight that's party over yeah you know what i mean it's not like the pros where if you get caught you can fight on and you know you pay 12 rounds this is three rounds and if you're not eligible and have a cut for into your second fight you'll be pulled out and also you know the great offers that i had from a lot of promoters around the world you know it's always been a fire burner these guys say me to become world special champion and when the opportunity arose, and you know, me and my father had a long talk and everything about it, and we decided that this is the right route. You know, we went ahead with it, and we said, let's do this, you let's put everything in there, and we won't ask it out, and let's go for the special thing. Yeah. I think, I think you've touched on something there. You, you look at Michael Conlon, for example, who I know you've, you've been training with recently. I think when you look at how, how long these guys can put into training camps, preparation for big tournaments, and then you know a shot, a, a disgusting decision, like like the Conlon decision can just derail the whole, the whole event, you know. So I think obviously it's hard for these guys. See, see for see for us fighters, Craig, we don't just train in the Olympic cycle for years. We've been training since we were kids for yeah. Olympic games and for stuff like that. Of course. And then we go into DP training in that Olympic cycle and do training camps all over the world, you know cutting down weight, eating all the right food, and then we get the likes of guys sitting at the side of the ring, drinking tea and sandwiches and biscuits stuff in their face, being able to judge us and being able to being able to corrupt us and take all the hard work away from us, you know, that, that that's just not on. And, yeah. You know, that was one of the main reasons that I, I left the amateur sport. How do we how do we stop that happening? Is it is it the governing bodies in the amateur scene that can stop that, or is it is it just something that will always be there in the amateur game? Do you think? To be honest, you know, whenever in my opinion, the only way you can stop that and make it a hundred percent is by knocking the guy out. Yeah. I don't think there's ever going to be a way where it's not going to be a little bit corrupt. That's that's the world we live in. You know, whether it's sport, whether it's Trump running for president of America or whatever it is, <laughs> there's always going to be politics, there's always going to be controversy and everything like that. And the more things that you can take into your own hands, and the more things that you can put down in cement, and granted it 100% by your own capability, that's what you do. But in some cases you can't do that, you just have to control what you can control. And, you know, I think the professional team is a lot more suited to that because obviously you could knock the guy out if you have 10, 12 rounds to do it, more so than three, three rounds in amateur, and it's a different style of fight. But at the end of the day, you know, you're always, whenever there's a judge sitting at the side of the table or a judge in everything, every man has his own opinion at the end of the day, and there's something you can obviously do with it. Yeah. Um. Speaking about obviously knockouts, I know you're partial to a knockout yourself. Uh, Ten knockouts in twelve fights for a middleweight is, is an impressive start to your career. When you face off against Glenn Tapia, how does the game plan change? Is it still a big knockout you're looking for, or are you, are you going to try and get the rounds in and, and outbox this guy? People uh, 
some people might believe me, you know, but I never looked for the knockout. Mm. So I get in there, and my number one goal, my number one plan as soon as I step through their ropes is to perform to the best I can. Because I know if I get in there and perform to the best I can, I'm going to give any man the steps in there and be one hell of a night. And I see it as I'll box the best I can. If I hurt a guy, if I wobble a guy, or if I see a stagger, I'm going in there for the kill and I'm going to take them out of there because that is what this game is all about. Mm. Professional boxing, you can't give anybody a second chance because one shot can change a fight, can change a life, can change a career. Because you get a man going, you take him out of there, and you see nothing in the face of his hands. You take it all under your own hands, you take him out of there, and be your own switch. You know, and that's the way I go about it. I'll never give any man a second chance in this sport because I've worked too hard and I've sacrificed too much to be giving people second chances. I get the opportunity, I'm going to take them Clinical, yeah, clinical finishing. Is, I think that's the key, and I think a lot of people probably do maybe headhunt and kind of look for the knockout a little bit too much. So it's interesting to hear you say that you you just box and and the knockouts will come, you know. Um, let, let, let me move on to the middleweight division just now, Jason. The middleweight division, obviously, you have Golovkin is is dominating the division at the top now. What I wanted to ask you is, do you think? If Golovkin wins all the belts, or Golovkin holds three of the four main belts, is that a positive for the division, or is it a negative? Does it hold guys back in each governing body from challenging for the titles? It's a positive for me, because I don't have to go and beat three or four guys to become world champion. I can just beat the one guy, then you're the, you're the king of the three, then you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think... I think um, I think, to be honest, WBO, WBA, IBF, WBC, there's four major world titles out there. And for me, as a personal goal, to be the absolute best and to be a world champion in any division, you need to hold all that belt. Yeah. So then you know you're the man. There's nobody turning around and saying he's world champion, he's world champion, he's world champion. If you have all the belts, you are the man. You're the king, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, you know, for boxing it's probably better that there is a few different belts where people can get a belt here and there um, as there is four different belts. And then obviously world champion fights world champion. Yeah. You know, that's great, that's exciting, that's great for the fans. But as a fighter, as a boxer myself, I want them belts and I want to fight everybody who has them belts to hold all the belts. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about being the man, being the king, having all that stuff wrapped around you. Yeah, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything that looks better than that. i seen a picture of Jermaine Taylor, who I think was the last guy to do it. And um, I, I couldn't see any skin. I could just see belts everywhere. That's all I could see. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's exactly what the, what the goal is. Just belts everywhere. Um, now, listen, it, it wouldn't be an interview with an Irish combat sports star if I didn't touch on a certain Conor McGregor. Uh, I've seen a picture of you on your Instagram with Conor McGregor on the way home at Christmas time. Do you, do you guys know each other? Or was that coincidence? Yeah, no, me and Conor know each other. Like, you know, we're both from Ireland, we're both from the combat sport and we both know each other. You know, I wouldn't be hanging about with him every time he's in America or anything like that. But, <laughs> you know, if he's ever about and I'm about and we both free time, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up and everything. You know, but uh, at the end of the day, Connor is doing massive, massive things for Irish combat sports. You know, he's putting Ireland on the map. He's doing us all for us. And, um, you know, what a class act, what he is, you know, what he's done in the UFC, no man has ever done it before, it's a, a number of people. Yeah, and in terms of the the crossover into into straight boxing, do you think do you think he's capable of doing that at a high level, or are you on the fence? Connor, Connor's in MMA and in UFC, Connor's probably one of the best boxers in 
Definitely. But when he transfers into the art of boxing itself, that is a different ballgame. You know, it's, um, he's looking to fight the likes of Mayweather. Like, the man has moved the combat sport of boxing so over a decade. You know, Connor is the man and has moved in the UFC his past three years. Yeah. It's a little, there's a little bit of a difference there, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. You put Mayweather in the cage with McGregor. McGregor will destroy him. Absolutely, I agree. Ten nights of the ten. You put McGregor in the ring with Mayweather. Mayweather beats him. Yeah. But Connor has a, uh, it's a more even fight in the ring than it would be in the cage in my eyes. Yeah. But at the end of the day... I still have Mayweather won it, you know, a box of my all day long. Yeah. Um, moving moving back on to yourself, Jason, I'll, I'll just finish off, mate. I know you've probably got a very busy day ahead. Um, if the year goes to plan, what, is, what does 2017 look like for Jason Quigley? To be honest, you know, 2017, every year now is a massive year for me. You know, every year now I'm looking to better myself every fight every month every year I'm looking to climb to grow and to become great you know but right now the only thing on my mind is Glenn Tapia March 23rd Fantasy Springs Resort and Casino for the NABF middleweight title that's my only focus every day I wake up every night to go to bed that's what's in my head and that's what I want to take care of business you know at the end of the day as well my team, Golden Boy Promotions, my management, Cheer Sports, they know the outline, they know the plan, they know the goals and the, the targets that are set for 2017 and, and, and the future, everything going well. But for me, that's their job. That's what they have. They have to look after everything outside the ring. Mm. And that's exactly what they're doing. And for me, I have to look after everything that goes on inside the ring and make sure all these goals and plans come together. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I'll be training. As always, you know, people say, I've had the best training camp of my life. I had this and that. You know, this is our job. We have to have the best training camp of our life, every training camp. We have to get in there. We have to work our asses off. And we have to be prepared. My training camps never start or stop. I'm always in shape. I'm always keeping taking over. And I'm always ready to go full tilt and get ready for a fight. So that's exactly where I'm at now. I'm deep in the training camp now, feeling good, feeling ready, and I'm excited come March 23rd. Fantastic, mate. Listen, Dustin, thank you very much for joining me on the call. An absolute pleasure to talk to you, mate. I've been a fan for a while now, and I'm looking forward to a big year ahead. Jason Quigley on Fight Talk today, ladies and gents. Thank you, mate. We look forward to catching up with you soon and watching you against Glenn Tapia, March 23rd. Have a good day, mate. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me.